stream is up. Uh, good evening, everyone. Monaco 64 here, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So this is our uh, usual Sunday live stream. We do it every Sunday, starting from 9 p.m. London. This is for uh, the new viewers, so they know. The other thing we do, we, we make a video every day or we post a video every day. Uh, so if you're new to the channel, make sure you click on the notification bell so you are advised when my new video comes out every day. Usually it's around 10 o'clock London, uh, maybe sometimes a little before, sometimes a little afterwards, depending on how long the video is and how much uh, editing and uh, how long it takes for me to publish it. Uh, it's nice to see all of you here already, even before uh, the, the official start. I usually start uh, about 10 minutes before, and it goes on for about an hour and 10 minutes. So we've got Rumpelstiltskin. He's gotten up early uh, in Tokyo or in Japan at 4.50 a.m. Monday. So it's not good evening. It's not just good evening. It's also good morning, good afternoon. Uh, we've got Belly Dance Arabia. Uh, Chris Jones, a uh, country sister from Central Texas, uh, T4 Parts, James Richter, hi uh, James, David Hughes, uh, Neil Hahn, Evola Sunglasses. Uh, I apologize if I miss some of you. There's so many. I try to uh, get all of you as much as possible. Dave L., Andrew Watson, uh, Paul Weens, John Norris. sheriff on youtube yeah uh billy is alive <laughs> he, he is getting on though he's going to be 14 soon uh unfortunately his vision is gone so he he has two walks a day he goes out in the garden um but uh, when i put him on that sofa he falls asleep and uh i mean that's what old dogs do they like to sleep carlos garcia philip julian uh from germany Alan Zibelman, Ohio Matsu, <laughs> uh, Bobby Critter uh, is the gold standard. Uh, greetings and salutation, Mario. Hello, Bobby. Blast from the past from the from Utah. Gordon D. Uh, Ann Sanderson, Fred Krueger, New Hampshire. Arson Benda, Italy. That's what I like uh, about this channel and the. Uh, the community i'm not really into uh nationalism and stuff i just like to you know talk to people anywhere where they might be it doesn't matter where they are uh, i guess uh the only problem <laughs> with the world is our, our governments right but uh people in general i would say are very nice anywhere around the world uh john bathia mark House Shield, Derek Barwise, Gomer, Gomer's 44 <laughs> from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, that's one of my uh, favorite uh, old programs was uh, Gomer Pyle. I don't know if you have that, uh, you know, Sergeant Carter and Gomer Pyle. I used to love watching that. Uh, Tricky Dicky, thank you for your super chat. Bought two sandwiches from a shop today came to eight pounds 10, literally couldn't believe it. Um, this uh, does not look good. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse, uh, the food prices, and that will be reflected in sandwich prices, of course. John Norris from Alaska, Randomness, uh, LG from Central Florida, Tom Cat, Newhan says buy silver and platinum, uh, Jimmy Grant, Good morning. He's uh, Monday morning in Melbourne, Australia. Good morning, Jimmy. Uh, Jack W. from Florida. Mangovis from Las Vegas. James Bernard, why bother with crypto if you are into gold and silver? Um, I have a small exposure to crypto. It's uh, mostly speculative. Yeah, and... and uh, Back in 2017, I already had this channel and crypto was growing a lot. And uh, there's some people in the silver space that 
gave up on silver, went into crypto. Yeah, <laughs> there, there was a, a big uh, temptation, but I still believe in gold and silver as money, uh, mainly because it, you can touch it and it's tangible and it has a track record of thousands of years. Crypto, it's like it can vanish out, out of thin air and uh, doesn't have the long track record. But I'm not going to stop people. The only thing that I like about crypto, but now it's getting, how can I say, hijacked by Wall Street and ma the mainstream. The, the thing that I like about it, it's, it's like a free market based currency. And that's a good thing. That's the, the only thing that I think has going for it. But now the uh, national governments and central banks and uh, financial regulators, they, they want to regulate that market. And that will really be a, a nail in the coffin for uh, people who are into freedom and free markets. Uh, Alan Zilberman, my son, Cozy Fantuti, good evening. Uh, Dilwyn Roberts is here, John Norris, MW351, Scott49, looks like the ruble is going to overthrow the dollar. Yeah, I don't think it's just a ruble. I think it's uh, more hard assets and eventually gold, I think, will uh, re re uh, reimpose itself after a 50-year uh, hiatus. That's just like a little blip uh, in a thousand plus year timeline. And that's why I think it, it, the, the ruble is just a, a symptom of that. I don't think the ruble itself will be the, the major reserve currency. I think it will be uh, a basket of many different currencies and gold will be an important part of that. Alain Roy uh, from Montreal the, in Canada. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes till the uh, official uh, start. We're going to look at uh, an article that I saw this morning when I woke up. Uh, I played golf today, didn't play very well, but I got up quite early as I usually do to take Billy out for his walk. And then I had a quick read at the FT before I went to play. And this caught my attention. And that's why the title of the, the live stream is about China uh, uh, and uh, yeah, China preparing for what would be catastrophic sanctions. Uh, and yes, it wouldn't only be catastrophic for China and the US, but for the entire world, I would say. So we're going to look at this article. Um, what I want to do today as well is show you quite a few different charts uh, about charts of CPI, charts charts of the Fed funds rates, charts of the balance sheet of, of the Fed and other central banks, um, charts of the NASDAQ and gold. So we can have a, an idea of the bigger picture because I think uh, things don't look great. And, uh, and that's why I think it's more important than ever to have uh, gold and silver outside the system. Um, even if things, if the central banks are able to contain inflation, which is a big ask, without causing any financial accidents, I think it's still good to have gold. But when we look at uh, these charts, you're going to see how much of a, how can I say, an obstacle they have to, to normalizing things. And, and I don't think things are going to go back to normal, especially as well, if this sanctions against China happens, that's still just uh, the fact that uh, the FT is talking about it is significant. I think they're mainstream. My uh, chicken mug, <laughs> just drinking some water. Uh, finance and economics says I've been saying that about sanctions targeting Russia. They not only hurt Russia, but people all over the world. Yeah. And China would be like uh, war. It would be comp it would be like uh, nuclear, <laughs> a nuclear event, so to speak. 
I, I think the sanctions on Russia have been like a not a nuclear weapon. It's been like a, a bomb, <laughs> uh, not a very strong, you know, it's been like a, an attack, but nothing nuclear. But with China, it would be significant. So yeah, so we can start. I'm going to go ahead and look at this article. I'm going to read through most of it. It's not very long. So let's have a look. Let's share it. So there you go. China meets banks to discuss protecting assets from U.S. sanctions. Uh, officials concerned that measures taken against Moscow uh, could also be applied to Beijing. I, I mean, we have spoken about that. And, and it's not only Beijing, all, all other uh, central uh, banks that are um, anti, you know, in the global south, so to speak, all the BRICS nations, and even some countries in Europe like Hungary that haven't played ball, for example, they, they should be worried, I would say. So Chinese regulators have held an emergency a meeting with domestic and foreign banks to discuss how they could protect the country's overseas assets from U.S.-led sanctions uh, similar to those imposed on Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, according to people familiar with the discussion. Uh, officials are worried that the same measures could be taken against Beijing in the event of a re regional military conflict or other crisis. Well, that could be Taiwan. But it could also be a place like the Solomon Islands. Uh, recently, uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk that the, the Chinese want to have a presence in the Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands are a very small archipelago nation, but they're very important uh, strategically uh, for uh, Australia and New Zealand. It's where the Battle of Guadalcanal was fought during World War II. So there's not just Taiwan. President uh, Xi Jinping's administration has maintained staunch support for Vladimir Putin throughout the crisis, but Chinese banks and companies remain wary of transacting any business with Russian entities that could trigger U.S. sanctions. So when I came back from playing golf, I have a WhatsApp WhatsApp chat with a couple of guys from one of them I used to work with in the city. The other guy used to work in the city as well. And they sent me the link to this article. And, and I replied, I said, well, yeah, I saw this this morning. And one of them said, um, China cannot let the West defeat uh, Putin because they're too uh, far uh bonded with China, with Russia. And I'd never, I hadn't thought of that. And that's very significant. And he thinks the Chinese are going to go for Taiwan because they're going to have to have an excuse to help Russia even more in the Ukraine. Because according, <clears throat> according to this guy, he uh, thinks uh, Xi Jinping is too invested in, in Putin. Uh, and uh, he's worried. So this is worrying for uh, not uh, Russia and China, uh, but also for us. The internal conference held on April 22nd included officials from China's central bank and finance ministry, as well as executives from dozens of local and international lenders, such as HSBC. Uh, Ministry of Finance said at the meeting that all large foreign domestic banks operating in China were, were represented. So um, this is what um, this guy said here. Um, if China attacks Taiwan, decoupling of the Chinese and Western economies will be far more severe uh, than the decoupling uh, with, with Russia because China's economic foot footprint touches every part of the world, said one of the uh, briefed one of the people briefed in the meeting. Can you imagine we already have the uh, commodity supply disruption, uh, especially in the grains, but also in energy because of the Ukraine situation? Can you imagine uh, uh, supply chain disruption for 
manufactured goods from China. We already already, of course, seen that a little bit because of the uh, because of uh, the COVID restrictions in China, and also the shipping lanes. I think around the world would be affected greatly if there is a a conflict uh, between China, Russia, and the West. So it it, it would be a real um, nuclear nuclear uh, style. Uh, economic, financial, geopolitical event. Hopefully, there won't be any use of nuclear weapons, of course. Um, hopefully, it will just be uh, proxy wars uh, in Taiwan or whatever. Uh, we'll see. But uh, the other interesting part here is how much China has in foreign reserves. Senior regulators. Uh, I won't say their name, but <laughs> and said, ask bankers in attendance what could be done to protect the nation's overseas assets. You see, they're worried because Russian uh, reserves uh, at other central banks were basically stolen or frozen, if you want to call it, we want to be kind. But you see, 3.2 trillion in foreign reserves. And uh, this is the composition of China's foreign reserves. They, they still hold more than 1.5 trillion in US securities. And uh, you can see that uh, I think it's about a trillion in US treasuries, as you can see here. Uh, the blue line, this is our long-term treasury securities they hold, like a trillion. Then they've got the agency mortgage-backed securities. So China is part of the housing market in the US. They're lending to US uh, homeowners. Uh, Long-term corporate, they don't have as many as that. They do have corporate stocks and short-term treasuries. So let's just look at some of the conclusions before we uh, get back uh, to the normal live stream. Some bankers present, however, present, sorry, President, however, doubted whether Washington could ever afford to cut economic ties with China, given its status as the world's second largest economy, huge dollar uh, holdings of dollar assets, and close trade relationships with the U.S. Um, you know, bankers, yeah, some of them are, you know, know what they're talking about. I, I guess they uh, almost went bankrupt in 08. They had to be saved by the taxpayer. So whatever these people say, it's not really etched in stone. And, and unfortunately, like back in 1923 or in the run-up to the Weimar hyperinflation, people were using the word katastrophen, uh, which is catastrophe in Germany, uh, as if it wasn't a catastrophe anymore because things just got worse and worse. And unfortunately, I have a feeling that this could be something that could happen, even though this guy is saying here he, he wouldn't see Washington doing that. But uh, I would say if the deep state is desperate, they could use that as a, another distraction. Uh, it is difficult for the US to impose massive sanctions against China, agreed Collier. It is, un, it is like mutually assured destruction in a nuclear war. But um, yeah, so the fact that uh, I think the FT is covering that is uh, somewhat worrying. So I'll come back to looking at your, uh, at your questions if you have any. Yeah, I'm here to answer questions as well. Feel free. Uh, sometimes during the week, I try to answer as many questions on the comment uh, section, but I, I can't do, do all of it, unfortunately. Uh, Joker Alpha says, Mario, China will not invade Taiwan until we get the third horseman famine. Uh, I would say that's pretty close, <laughs> actually. So, or they, you know, they, who knows? Who knows? You could be right. Lord Humongous. Hi, Lord Humongous. Nice to see you. He says, it's easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. Uh, Grandy, 
grandee, <laughs> grandee, <laughs> how do you convert large amounts of capital into physical silver? Comex only way? No, I, I would uh, go to a, a bullion dealer. No, Comex is not the way. Uh, we have seen people like Rafi Farbers and others last year. They bought one contract of Comex. They tried to take delivery. They were never able to take delivery. No, uh, large amounts of uh, silver, you're going to have to go through uh, the big bullion dealers. I, I don't know where you are. You need to check in your country. Um, yeah, you might have to use more than one. Make sure you use a reputable one, but not Comex. That's the last place you want to go. Uh, war is a racket. That's right, Lord Humongous. Uh, Tom Joad, should I sell silver, my silver quart? Um, I don't give advice here about stock holdings, but I'm holding on to my uh, miners, gold and silver miners. Yes, they've taken a hit in the last couple of weeks, but uh, I'm I'm in it for the long haul, and uh, I'm not really trading uh, the miners. And a lot of them pay a nice dividend as well. I think that's important. And uh, as for physical gold and silver, that's not really a, a something to trade unless you're going to do COMEX futures. And that's something uh, to have as insurance. And we're going to look at some charts uh, uh, soon. And I'm going to show you how worrying things are, I think, uh, looking at these charts, that uh, the central banks are really in a tight spot. And I, I would be shocked if they're able to normalize things and bring down inflation with, with uh, no problems. <laughs> And even, even if they are, it's still a good thing to have gold and silver. Uh, Richard Martin, is the stock market in the bull correction or bear? Uh, yeah, good question um, that you asked that because I have a chart here I wanted to show uh, of the NASDAQ. Um, Let's have a look. Let's share it with you guys. Uh, where is that? Okay, there we go. So that's the NASDAQ chart. And it's a logarithmic chart. So it's a percentage term chart. And it's going back to the mid 80s, as you can see. And uh, what's interesting, if you look here, this is the crash in 2020. It looks like a little blip, doesn't it? So, and this is the top in uh, 2000, dot-com bubble of the NASDAQ. Um, and uh, I actually think that's what we're forming. We're forming a similar top to this one, especially now with the Fed talking about tightening about unwinding its balance sheet. I think it's going to be pretty much impossible uh, to keep this uh, bubble going. So am I saying there's going to be a, a crash like uh, we, we saw here in March 2020? No, I, I think it's going to be more protracted uh, bear market. It's going to take a, a year, probably even more maybe two years, and it's be going to be very painful. There's going to be uh, like uh, counter trend corrections upwards, which are usually quite strong in a bear market, and people are going to be, be uh, investors going to say, oh, the bear market is over, and then it's going to go down again. And I think it was Michael Oliver from um, Momentum, Momentum Structural Analysis that said that uh, only one bear market, I think that was the 1929 bear market, started with a crash. Uh, when there's a crash like we had here in March 2020, that's not the start of a bear market. So, yeah, I think he's right, Mr. Oliver. He's been around longer than I have, and uh, I tend to agree with him. We're not going to see a, a massive crash, but we're going to be see continued pain like we did from 2000 to around 2003. So it could be from 2021 to 2024. 
So that's my view on the uh, stock market. And I use the NASDAQ because it's really been, it has really been, been leading all the stock markets. And this trend line here is, might give you an idea where, of where we could actually go. So there you go. I hope that helped. Um, Uh, Joker Alpha says, I take it back, China may invade Taiwan to start a second front. Yeah, that's what my friend said today, the guy who, who's in the WhatsApp chat, because if you listen to, and I don't listen to them too much, even though I, we have to, of course, the Western powers like the UK and the US and the EU are, are they're not letting up, they're, they're still... Uh, provoking Russia, they're sending for you know weapons to Ukraine, and, and uh, I think uh, Liz Truss, who's the foreign secretary in the UK, I think it was her. She said, "Oh, this war could go on for a decade." So uh, I think they're really desperate to uh, get rid of Putin and uh, take over Russia in terms of influence, and I think China. China's done a lot of stuff, a, a lot of deals with Russia in the last decade or so. They, a few years ago, they, they built a pipeline in eastern Russia, Siberia, thereabouts, uh, that goes into China. Uh, they have, a, you know, even the Russian Central Bank has opened a branch in, the, I think, Shanghai or Beijing. So they've really been cooperating. And uh, I think uh, China, especially Xi Jinping, doesn't want to see his best buddy uh, being taken out. <laughs> so am I defending these guys? No, we're just observing to see what could happen and uh, try to protect ourselves. Uh, DR, Mario, have, have you heard of the Golden Prospect Precious Metals uh, listed stock on LSC, basically Junior Gold Silver Miners Fund? No, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. I haven't heard. But I would say uh, most uh, mining investments in gold and silver and commodities are going to do well in the next few years. That's not to say that you shouldn't really look into the company that you're investing, but I haven't heard of that one. Sorry. Dilwyn Roberts, China to invade Taiwan, then back you won with gold. I guess they wouldn't have a choice because if that were to happen, all those trillions of reserves, uh, foreign reserves, would probably be uh, completely uh, frozen forever. And they'd have to uh, kickstart their e economy with, uh, well, <laughs> that would probably be a blessing in disguise uh, in the long term. Um, back it with real money, not with worthless uh, mortgage-backed securities or U.S. treasuries. Probably a, a, a good thing, actually. It might, it won't be a, a good thing in the short term. And maybe that's one of the reasons why China has been uh, stockpiling commodities for the last 12 to 18 months, uh, not just because they saw how the, the Fed inflated the, their balance sheet, but also because they know what's coming geopolitically. Lee C. R. ever watched ben, Benja, Benjamin Fulford? Well, I have. And I have to say, uh, I think he's full of it. Yes, there are things he talks about, but uh, he doesn't really use any, doesn't name any sources. I, he, I just think he's egging people on. Uh, I, you know, I... I uh, I think generally speaking, he's got the right idea of what's going on, but he try, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, it's up to you, but uh, I, I, uh, 
I get some of his stuff sent to me, but uh, I rarely read it anymore. Benjamin Fulford, he, he did work for, uh, I think, Forbes magazine years ago. But uh, anyway, uh, Golden Gate, can you comment on if and when the debt market will implode and the effects it will have, such as credit freeze? Thank you. Um, so with that, let's bring uh, another chart, some more charts that I have here. Um, I'm going to start with the Fed funds rate. Uh, which the Fed will probably raise the target of on Wednesday by 50 basis points. And right now, the Fed funds rate is uh, a quarter, because there's a target, a quarter to half a percent. That's the target. And this is the rate at which uh, federally insured or banks that are in the Federal Reserve System financial institutions, credit unions. That's the rate at which they lend to each other non-collateralized overnight. So the, the Federal Reserve sets that target. So they're expected to raise it uh, to 0.75 to 1%. So the reason I want to show you this chart is that ever since 1980, the Fed funds target has been going down. We're seeing lower lows and lower highs in every credit cycle. And by credit cycle, I mean when the Fed starts tightening, they, they, they have never been able ever since 1980 to go back. Uh, Yet yeah, they haven't needed, or if they tried, uh, they would have caused a huge, even huge more, uh, bigger accident. Uh, so, I would be surprised if we get back uh, above two and a half percent without an accident. That's in terms of the Fed funds rate. And you can see here the gray bars are usually when there are recessions. In the early 80s, there was a double dip, like one after the other. Uh, I have a feeling we, we, we're getting a double dip right now, the one in uh, 2020. And I think we're already in one now. Uh, they haven't really made it official. And then there's uh, the accidents that happen as well, because uh, if there's a credit accident, um, our economies have been based, uh, you know, the Western economy since the uh, early 80s when Paul Volcker raised rates all the way up to almost 20%. We've been a financialized economy. We outsourced all the manufacturing to China and other uh, emerging market countries. And uh, our economies have been based on uh, credit, uh, borrowing, speculation, real estate, big government, <laughs> and, and no manufacturing. And now all of that is reversing, not just uh, the interest rates, I would say, but also uh, the globalization. Uh, with COVID, no, you know, it doesn't matter what you think about it. We're seeing all the supply chains disrupted. Now, if China, for example, um, is sanctioned, it's going to be even worse. So how can we support a, a credit system, a financialized uh, system uh, that is dependent on cheap credit and also dependent on over, overseas supplies of everything that we buy? How can we uh, unwind that with no huge accident? I, I think it's uh, it's worrying. It's worrying. And I think, unfortunately, millions and millions of people are going to suffer, not just financially, but also uh, a lot of people will uh, probably die because they're not going to be able to afford uh, to, uh, yeah, they're not going to be able to afford the necessities of, of life. And that's not just in emerging mar market countries. That's in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, the UK, uh, even Australia, I would say. So um, that's the Fed funds target. <laughs> can you see there? They're talking that about being hawkish. Can you really believe they can raise rates, you know, to five, seven percent? 
I, I mean, it's crazy. And, uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, if they get above two and a half, I will be surprised. And, uh, I'm going to show you as well, a chart of the, uh, 10 year yield, because, uh, this is short term rates that the fed can control, but, uh, the 10 year yield is, uh, it's more of a market rate. It's more of a benchmark for the, the price of credit, not just for the United States government, but also for businesses all around the world. So again, it's done like the Fed funds. It's gone lower lows, lower highs. And uh, I haven't drawn a line here. I could, but we, you know, take my word for it. If you draw, draw a trend line from here through to here, we've broken out of that. We did the same like in 2018 here. And then, and then everything reversed. And then we had the repo crisis around here and yields went even lower. You know, the Fed had to start. They, they had to reverse everything, right? The, the Fed has tried this before. And, and that was with a lot less leverage and debt. Uh, you know, that was unwinding. They were trying to unwind the uh, response to the 08 crisis. Um, and uh, rates were starting to rise. And they got up to around just uh, above 3%. Right now, we settled, I think, uh, on Friday around 293 So, uh, yeah, I, I think here in the 10-year, the, the level around 3.25%, that will be uh, also a level to watch where you could see a, a huge credit event and um, yeah, look out. So I hope this has helped. So I'll get back to the uh, comment section now. And uh, so let's have a look. Uh, glutamate sulfate. Don't you think that the price of gold and silver has been capped down by the white hats to prepare the masses for this very moment when the US dollar is about to collapse. Um, I, I don't think the, uh, the U, US dollar will collapse. Uh, the symptom of that will be a higher gold and silver price. Yes, they might have been able to suppress the price. And I have spoken about that many times, you know, the manipulation. But I, I think we need to put that, uh, forget about that, because uh, things will be what they will be. Uh, and I think uh, what the suppression will, will, will do, and the same thing happened in the 60s. They had the London gold pool. At the time, the price of gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. And they actually announced it convert overtly that they were all the major Western central banks were managing the price of gold to keep it there. But all that did uh, was create a massive pressure cooker <laughs> uh, event, so to speak. And then in the early 70s, they couldn't keep that going anymore, the manipulation, because they're running out of gold. And uh, the lid of the pressure cooker just blew off and the price of gold went from $35 to almost 900 in, in less than 10 years, didn't go there in a straight line. And, and I think the, the same thing is happening now. Uh, and I'll, I'll bring a gold chart <laughs> that I have to talk about that. Uh, and I'll share it with you guys. And I've been drawing these charts this afternoon uh, for this live stream, of course. And uh, so here's, um, you know, if you go back, uh, the chart doesn't go further back than 71, but if, if you go back to prior to 71, the gold price was always at 35. And in the 60s, uh, the London gold pool, uh, like uh, the Fed, the Bank of England, the Bank of France, the Bundesbank, the Bank of Japan, the major Western central banks, they came to an agreement that they were going to use their gold reserves to keep the price of gold from uh, rising above 35. And why they do that? Well, because uh, the U.S. was inflating. They, they were uh, inflating uh, the money supply or the currency supply without having enough gold to cover it. But then towards the end of the uh, London gold pool, when it unraveled in 
late 60s, the, the French said, well, we had enough. We have enough. We don't want to keep uh, selling our gold to protect the dollar. And that's what happened here. You see, we went from 35 all the way to almost $1,000, just below 900. Yes, it was in a straight line. There's a lot of noise in between. And I'm sure a lot of people at the time were concerned, maybe had bought gold around here and it got here and then it fell and they got out and then they missed this move. Um, and uh, this is what happened after Volcker, of course, let rates go to 20%. I don't think they can do that now. There's no chance in hell that uh, they can let uh, interest rates go to 20 now. And if they did, the whole financial system, corporations, governments would go bust. And even then, you'd want to have gold, I would say, outside the system. But you can see that the disinflationary 80s and 90s were not kind to gold. Uh, especially here in the mid to uh, late 90s. And I think this was a, a time when um, the U.S. Treasury, with the uh, help and guidance of Robert Rubin, who, who, who was a bullion dealer at Goldman Sachs, then became the, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, became U.S. Treasury Secretary. He, along with Larry Summers, who was his deputy at the Treasury, they devised uh, the gold leasing arrangements, so what they did, they kept leasing gold in order to keep the, the price suppressed. Uh, and then they built this pressure cooker here. You see, this is like a equivalent of what we've had now here, I would say. This took from like uh, 97 to, let's say, 2003. So like six years of suppression, pressure cooker. But look what happened afterwards. And uh, I would say that the same thing is been happening since here a bit of suppression uh even here you know there's like another little pressure cooker within this pressure cooker so i i think it's only a, a matter of time until uh gold and silver as well for that matter uh do this or this so i'm not concerned um yeah, the daily uh, noise is worrying sometimes, but uh, so that's how I see it there. Yeah, silver tasks as a gold sovereign. Yeah, I think it costs around 375 to 380, depends on the dealer. I remember actually when I bought my uh, first gold sovereigns, they were 50 pounds. <laughs> Uh, back in uh, 2002. Yeah. I wish I'd bought a lot more than what I did. Uh, Joseph Mario Morich, World War III is here. Forget theories, speculations, and predictions. Prepare for survival. You're probably right. Uh, one way to survive, though, is to have some kind of uh, monetary insurance outside the system, but not just money, but also have, uh, you know, be in a close knit community, um, know people that have different uh, skills. Yeah, and be nice to people because if you're not nice to people, you're not going to be able to be part of a community. I think that's really important as well. Uh, Gordon Hamilton, thank you for your super chat. Uh, Joe Brown, is the world ending? No, I, I don't think it's ending at all. And with that, I'm going to come to uh, a couple of books. Um, one is a book that I read a few years ago, and it's about the Templars, the rise and fall of God's holy warriors uh, by Dan Jones. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this book is because I think Dan Jones is a really good historian and writer. So I recommend this. Am I a, a, a Knights Templar uh, fan and Illuminati? No, but it's really interesting. Uh, 
then some people argue that the, it was the Knights Templars that started international banking. They, they started the whole trust system as well in the, the Anglo-Saxon trust system. But the other one is, uh, he's, I went out a few weeks ago and I went into a bookstore and I saw that he's just written another one, Powers and Thrones. Uh, this is uh, a new history of the Middle Ages by Dan Jones. So what, what, what's that got to do with the end of the world? Well, you know, he, he talks uh, about the Roman Empire before the Middle Ages. And you could argue that the world ended for the Roman Empire. But the world, uh, yeah, yeah, there's always this uh, a thing about the world ending. And I think it, it's more like the way the world has been is going to shift and end, but the physical world won't end. And, and I think uh, people can thrive in any kind kinds of uh, circumstances. And, and I don't think you should let it get you down <laughs> that the world is changing. If anything, uh, these are the periods where people can benefit the most. And uh, am I being a little bit uh, mercenary here? No, but I, I think uh, what's the problem with benefiting? And don't let uh, the mainstream media, the politicians and others like scare you into submission because that's what they want. They want you to be dependent on them. So one of the reasons for my channel is to try to help people become more self-sufficient and self-reliant. And of course, uh, the system hates that because they want to have a, a purpose. Uh, their purpose, of course, is to tell us what to do and, and to keep control of our lives. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so no end of the world <laughs> in a short uh, statement. There's a few more charts I wanted to show you. Oh yeah, it's the, uh, I'm gonna show you the consumer price index. And that's not the, uh, the percentage chain changes that we see come out every month. No, this is the actual index. And this is from Fred, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So this goes back to 1947. You can see that um, in the post-war period, yeah, the, the, C, the, the consumer price index did rise, uh, but it actually started really picking up, right? Just in the late 60s. And look at the, the slope here really accelerated. And that was when you had, you know, the high inflation of the 70s. I think a lot of this inflation was germinated back in the 60s when they had the London gold pool, right? They're trying to suppress the gold price because they knew they were inflating. So the inflate, the monetary inflation was here. And then you had the price rises. That was the consequence of the inflation. And then they've been able to keep it pretty, you know, it has kept going up, but it stabilized it, you know, this this slope here stabilized and it stayed pretty stable most of the time, but look what's happening now. And I would say as well that this whole period from uh, 1980 to 2020, uh, they've been germinating, inflation has been germinated just like it was here, you see? And the reason people don't realize this is because we've been told that there has been no inflation in since the 80s but we have and now the prices are taking off and i think it's going to be just like here so this is not going to drop right back or <laughs> or the the slope is not going to moderate in my opinion and uh now i'll show you the uh, chart um of the cpi percentage changes so that will give you a better view of what's going on. And, you know, this relates to that question uh, one of the viewers had about 
if there's going to be a credit event, you know, how, if they can really raise rates. Um, so you see, this is um, so this is the '60s. Uh, people thought, oh yeah, there's no inflation, and then all of a sudden it starts taking off, right? Same here. Uh, for 20 years, people were told there's no inflation, but we still had like we, CPI was still running, you know, positive. It was only here, for example, that uh, it was negative for one year, but that was an, an anomaly. But look at it now. I mean, this is not good. This is really breaking out. So can the Fed really, really uh, do anything about this without bringing everything down? I don't think so. So I think it's good to look at these uh, long-term charts and look at what's happening because, um, yeah, we can get bogged down in the day-to-day, week-to-week movements of markets and comments. And um, yeah, so uh, we're almost there. And I think I've shown you most of the charts that I wanted. So we'll go back to the... Uh, to your questions and comments. Uh, Georgia Guidestones. Yeah, I've, um, I'm aware of the Georgia Guidestones. No one really knows who put it there. They're looking for 500 million world population. Hopefully that's just uh, nothing serious. Someone put that there just to worry people, to make us scared. Uh, yeah, Lord Humongous, Henry Kissinger is 100. Yeah, <laughs> I think David Rockefeller lived to 101, didn't he? These guys seem to uh, live uh, long, long lives. Rolf Steiner, 33 billion for Ukraine, magical Freemasonic. Yeah, I did think about that, you know, 33. Why couldn't they pick 31 or 32? Had to be 33. Low blood pressure, Jim Rickards says no inflation without money velocity. Well, I think he's been proven wrong. And I guess he he uses the, uh, I would say the wrong definition of inflation because inflation is the creation of currency and credit out of thin air, not backed by real money. And then the consequence of that is rising prices. And we have had high, rising prices, but it's been mostly in financial ass, assets and real estate. And now <laughs> the Quintillion effect is moving all, all those, all that monetary inflation, uh, credit and monetary inflation into real goods. And uh, I think, unfortunately, you know, I, I, I have books by Jim Rickards. I, I think he's... Uh, yeah, clever guy, but uh, I think he's gotten it wrong on inflation. <sighs> T4 parts, stocking pot noodles. <laughs> Grandy, ask yourself why silver is worth half the 1980s price. Yeah, I mean, they do use uh, the derivatives to, uh, you know, like all, all uh, trading instruments are leveraged. And uh, but I did an interview with these guys, uh, North Star Bad Charts. Check them on YouTube. I, it was last week, an hour interview. And they, they've gone back like almost 100 years to look at the silver price. And if you uh, smooth out, you know, the these spikes to 50 that we've had. Silver has actually been a really good store of value. It has protected against the, you know, the falling dollar. So yeah, it is frustrating, but don't forget uh, in about 18 months before silver topped uh, in 1980 at $50, uh, silver was just breaking out of the seven or eight level. So, you know, it went from seven and eight, almost straight up to 50. So that's what happens, you know, and, and we could see that happen again. We could break through 30 and then 50 and go to 200 and then drop back to like 80. 
And then everyone that bought at 100 and 200 are going to be really annoyed. So I, I think you have to look at it more in the long term. And um, yeah, silver, uh, of course, speculating in, in paper, paper silver, and even the miners, you need to be careful. But having silver coins, nice old junk silver and stuff over a long term, I think is a great thing to do, to have. <clears throat> Graham Hobbs, in the future, can you see a situation where we transition to deflation? Um, not, not in this current monetary regime system. That would mean they'd have to um, shrink the money supply and credit. And I don't think they're going to do that. They're going to try to slow it down, but never shrink it. But uh, yeah, I, I think we're past uh, the point where they can uh, have uh, deflate the money supply. And by deflation, I don't mean prices dropping. I mean the supply of currency and credit shrinking. And that's the other thing people get wrong. Uh, deflation is not falling prices. And uh, yeah, that that's so I don't see it. And uh, I can't see the current uh, political leaders and monetary leaders wanting deflation. That would be the end for them. Can you imagine if we have the money supply and credit shrinking? Uh, the public would be up in arms. The, the general public, <clears throat> excuse me, even though we're not supposed to like inflation, uh, most people like inflation because uh yeah it's you know they get all the freebies from governments so i don't see deflation uh for the disenfranchised Monaco, we will will we see a great migration from west to the east fleeing cost of living do you mean West, like from the Western world to like Eastern Europe and Russia and China? Or do you, I don't know where you are. Are you in the US, like from the West, West of the US to the East? Uh, I don't think that's a solution, really, because it's going to affect the whole world. So I, I, I think, uh, excuse me. There's the old saying, you know, that uh, the grass is always greener somewhere else. So I think we personally, I, I'm not going to migrate anywhere. I think I'll try to stay put and try to make the best of it. But you could be right. Uh, glutamate sulfate. Hello, uh, Mary. If the U1 gets back by gold, how will it impact? Impact what, uh, glutamate? Uh, impact what? Uh, sorry, I, you didn't finish your question. I guess you, you mean the gold price, maybe? Uh, I mean, it's not really how it would impact gold. It's how it would really crush uh, all the other fiat currencies because if China went on a gold standard, that would be the end of the dollar and all, all its other currencies that are part of the dollar system. Uh, as for the price of gold, um, it, it probably uh, be like thousands and thousands of dollars once that happened. Retro landscape, could you please tell me why gold dealers of any kind want you to buy gold and silver in exchange for fiat currency doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Why doesn't it make any sense? It's their business. Just because they're gold dealers doesn't mean that, you know, um, we are in the fiat currency world. So how can they pay their bills with fiat currency? It doesn't mean that they don't like gold and silver because uh, they don't they don't just sell gold and silver retro landscape they buy it as well so it's like saying a, a car dealer why, why would he take cash for it for a car that he sells 
Well, because he's got to pay his bills. And if he has extra fiat at the end of the month, he might go and buy a car or, or a gold dealer. If he has extra fiat, he might go and buy some gold and silver for himself or herself. So, yeah, I've heard this question before and it doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry to, to say that to you, but uh, it's, it's a business, right? Doesn't mean they don't like gold and silver. Hopefully that helps. Oh, you've asked it again. Okay. Second time. <sighs> I've got a couple of more charts here. Yeah, uh, another one that shows how we need to uh, hold on to our hats. <laughs> so this is the uh, major central bank's balance sheets, total assets in trillions of dollars. Um, so it was around $5 trillion before the 08 crisis. And now we are at... Uh, 31 and it's starting to go down and can you have you noticed how much of an impact just this little move lower here has had in the bond markets we've seen the 10-year yield go from one and a half in the beginning of this year to almost three percent and that's just on on this right and also on the tiny rate hike the fed did from zero to 25 basis points can can you really imagine can you imagine the world financial uh financial economic world uh if this comes down a lot more and interest rates go a, a lot higher i mean it will be a mess so maybe that's why there will be uh some kind of conflagration uh between the west china and russia they will use that as a cover to basically uh, just uh, wipe everything off and uh, print even more. So uh, that's the other, uh, that's, I think, the last chart I wanted to show you. Okay. So I'll uh, stick to the questions now. Again, I'm sorry if I didn't see everyone's questions. It's uh, very difficult. I think we've got like a thousand people here concurrently or that was the top concurrent but uh, i'll try to answer as many as possible gordon hamilton you said that the lme was finished how long do you think it will take for it to die yeah the lme uh i think they uh nailed uh, <laughs> quite a f uh, few they hammered quite a few nails in their coffin by canceling trades in nickel and uh, it will take a while. And I think um, the LME is actually uh, owned by Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong institution. So maybe also the geopolitical aspect could be another nail in the coffin of the LME. Um, and I, I think uh, the Chinese, they have um, opened exchanges where you can trade the base metals in China as well. So I think it's going to migrate more and more to that part of the world. So yeah, but LME is going to become probably a, a second tier market. Um, and I think what they did as well is pretty bad. And I think, you know, to, to cancel trades that people thought they had done not only once, but twice. Echo, Echo, can you recommend a reliable dealer for buying a beautiful 19th, 19th florin like you showed? Uh, yeah. I, I've bought some of my uh, florins on eBay, but also here in the UK, uh, I go to uh, 
Peter Morris coin, coins and medals in Bromley. Uh, yeah, you, you can look at his website, Google Peter Mo Morris coins and medals. He has Florence, you have some, and also shillings. Uh, Matt Bittner, uh, the FOMC is a two day meeting. It starts Tuesday and ends on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, they, they will announce their decision, which will most probably be an uh, increase of 50 basis points. And then uh, I think half an hour later, the announcement was at 2 p.m. New York, half an hour later, um, Jay Powell will uh, conduct a press conference and he will answer questions too. Low blood pressure, how would you buy land near you if it goes few ounces of silver per acre? Well, you just find the uh, farmer or whoever owns the land and uh, see, uh, you know, negotiate uh, with him or her. So how many, you know, that's, that's what you do. And I think... Uh, the more and more things get worse monetarily, i.e., you know, the inflation and people start moving to gold and silver, uh, people will know the value of things, you know. Glutamate sulfate, how do you envision the future of banks? <sighs> well, yeah, I think the banks are in trouble right now, especially if interest rates keep rising. Uh, they, they've been the, been the major beneficiary of this 40-year uh, financialization that we've had uh, because we've had uh, plentiful and cheap credit. So I, I think that's reversing now. So the future for banks are going to be very different. I think they're going to be less and less involved in speculation. Uh, prior to Glass-Steagall being repealed in 99, commercial banks... Uh, could not could not do uh, investment banking business. And I think we'll go back to that. Uh, ideally, though, I would say that the best thing that could be done to make the banks safer is to um, not allow banks to become uh, public corporations. Uh, so, so what does that mean? If you want to open a bank, it has to be a, a private partnership. So if the bank gets into trouble, the partners get into trouble, uh, individual partners privately, they could lose all their fortunes. So that would make banks a lot safer. So it's very easy to do, but they have so much political power at the moment that that would never be allowed to do to be done. Uh, uh, Lord Humongous, thank you for getting rid of this. Uh, Intruder. <laughs> Last from the past, Billy does not have a silver dog bowl. No. Well, he his water is in a silver-like bowl, but it's not silver. we got a couple of minutes. Uh, Robert, Robert, what will Powell do if the markets keep crashing into next Tuesday? I don't think he's going to change <laughs> uh, anything. He's still going to raise rates uh, by 50. All it might do is maybe change some of the comments he makes. But if, if he were not to raise rates just because the Dow drops another thousand points tomorrow and Tuesday, that would make, uh, he'd lose all credibility, not that he has meant much credibility right now, at least for me. Neil Han wants God to bless only America and every, everyone here. Well, I'd say God should bless the whole world, not just America, but there you go. Uh, Joker Alpha, do you think Facebook Meta Virtual World will replace social media NFTs? To be honest, Joker Alpha, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say what I really think, but uh, I don't really care. 
<laughs> I don't care about the metaverse or NFTs. I think it's they're complete like uh, bubbles, I would say. And I don't think they're going to take off. All right. Um, just one last question here, and then we'll call it a day. Sapporo 2891, will Russia win the war? Yes. There you go. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up and participating. Uh, if you're new to the channel, of course, uh, I do this live stream every Sunday at 9 o'clock London time, 9 p.m. London. And I do a video, uh, I post or do a video every day as well. Uh, so make sure you uh, click the little notification bell to be notified of all my new videos. Have a great rest of the weekend and a great